focused on creating data intensive solutions that enable learners and educators to interact with artificial intelligent out, intelligence outputs and data visualizations meaningfully. And then we have Gloria Milena uh, Fernandez Nieto, um, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, in connected intel uh, at the Connected Intelligence Center. And her current research focuses on exploring alternatives of, uh, of feedback to understand traces from data collected uh, in the CSEL classroom to prompt reflection in teaching and learning practices. And many of you who've been uh, to the series before have gotten to know Simon Buckingham Shum, who's a professor of learning informatics at the University of Tech, uh, Technology, Sydney, prior to which um, he held this title at the Open University in the UK. As the director of UTS Connected Intelligence Center, his team invents, pilots, and deploys advanced educational technologies um, at UTS and using data analytics and AI to provide better feedback to educators and students. Um, and he's co-authored and edited several volumes dedicated to um, the design of software uh, to uh, augment thinking, addressing specifically the interplay of learning, analytics, AI, and human-centered design. All right, so uh, without further ado, I'm happy to hand things off uh, to our presenters. And thanks again for everybody for, for joining us. Thanks very much, uh, Brendan. And um, the dog's just joining in with me right there on cue. Um, so it's my pleasure to present this joint work. I'll set the scene and then hand over <clears throat> to Roberto and who will then pass to Gloria. Vanessa can't join us today, unfortunately, but this is based on a lot of her PhD work as well, which you can find out more about um, um, in the links that we, that we share. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about using quantitative ethnography as an approach for studying co-located teamwork activity in, in learning. And we'll talk about a, a construct called the multimodal matrix as approach to, to modeling this. And we'll, we'll, we'll illustrate how quantitative ethnography principles are, 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 are carried through in this work, but we're not using epistemic network analysis, unlike most of the previous presentations. So we're gonna argue that this is still QE in spirit and in the way that we're thinking, but we're not using ENA. All right, so very quickly, well, the promise of big data and all the excitement about it in, 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 in the broad scheme of things is that we have a way of studying complex societal systems. Um, that's why people are so interested in it, I, I think, because we, we, we can have sensors which pick up what's going on in these complex, complex systems um, at huge scale and speed, and that enables us to, to make changes, to sense the system in ways that we've never been able to do before. Okay, obviously, sensing systems at scale uh, and, and high fidelity brings its own ethical issues with it, which are being widely discussed as, we, uh, as, as this infrastructure emerges. Uh, and those issues carry through into any context where you're using sensors, data, and analytics and even AI now. Okay, now, we're obviously all interested in human activity systems particularly, not just about studying machines, talking to machines. Um, and that introduces all the complexities of trying to understand what things mean in those systems. And that's why we're so interested in, in the ethnographic qualitative aspects um, that QE brings. And the key challenge is, well, what does it mean to handle that intersection with integrity? To actually take seriously the meanings that the, the participants are constructing as they engage in some activity, and then claim to be able to say something about that when we're talking about you know, the low level sensor data that computers um, see the world as. We're particularly interested in learning and teaching systems um, and the role of data science and analytics uh, in that. But we're not just interested in studying them as researchers so that we can say new things about the processes of learning. Um, we want to actually develop practical tools that mean they augment that learning and teaching activity. And that's where human-centered design comes in because we want to create artifacts that are going to do a good job of that, that, that may well be extremely useful for us as researchers studying the, those phenomena. But we want, the con we want the participants of that activity system to themselves be able to see their process 
okay? And that closes a feedback loop to them. So human-centered design comes in and we are therefore drawing on the kinds of disciplines that tell us how we design such artifacts, HCI, how we design data and AI, and think about that ethically in a learning context. And also, you know, the broader science and technology studies and uh, um, critical data studies kinds of perspectives that are brought to thinking about what happens when you bring big data into learning and teaching. And then because we're talking about learning and teaching, of course, we have to appeal to education and the learning sciences and the assessment sciences um, to, to understand how you actually um, design specifically for these contexts. The context that we are working in um, uh, is the training of nurses in simulation wards of the sort you can see here. Um, now, you'll notice from that top photo that we've got five beds going here, five teams all working on a simulation, on a mannequin, um, playing different roles. This is used widely in different institutions around the world. You've got multiple teams in action and you've got one instructor typically who is roving around trying to keep track of what's going on. So when we learn more about this kind of teaching and learning context, it's a it's this is a complex social system and cognitive system. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. Uh, could we augment the instructors senses with uh, with multimodal senses? Could we improve the ability to give feedback in a timely way using uh, analytics? So that was our intuition. These are the kinds of data sources that we're picking up voice data streaming off the patient simulator, uh, movement and positioning as they carry these badges around on them, and physiological data off, off their wristbands. So it's, it's like a great multimodal analytics opportunity, but the real question is, okay, now we're gonna have this massive explosion of data. Um, and that, there's a big gulf between that and giving meaningful feedback to the participants. So the question is, where does quantitative ethnography have a contribution to make? And could the work that we're doing actually help you, our, our QE colleagues, think differently about the way you do your work? Are we developing some useful representations or tools that could help? So before we launch in, just to note that the idea of using epistemic network analysis, for example, as an instance of QE, to, to generate real-time feedback has already been developed. So this was an example from the work from the Wisconsin lab, right, where you are using ENA to power a real-time feedback interface for a teacher. This was what, this was from online activity. Um, so we're trying to do something analogous, but for face-to-face co-located activity. So we're not talking about clicks here, we're talking about movement and action and uh, physiological data and so forth. And we're not gonna give real-time feedback, but we want to input to inform the debriefing that happens immediately after the simulation. So there's, there's the, um, the sort of the, the nexus of the three, the three perspectives that are coming together here. And we're pulling from CSCL and from assessment research. And we're going to try and understand the human activity system not only from a theoretical perspective, but empirically. We have to observe simulations as they run. We're talking to the expert clinicians and we are using co-design techniques to invent uh, artifacts that we hope will help. And a point to note is that we are not just trying to study the human activity system as it currently is, we are trying to invent a future activity system as well. So there is a design aspect to it here as well. And that's not necessarily something that all QE work is interested in. Okay, so I'm gonna just stop sharing there and pass over to Roberto, who's gonna take you into the next um, phase of this work. Yes. So. Ooh. 
Okay, so uh, let's now go into the details about how we did, or how we put everything together. Um, so we started from co-designing with teachers and with students. This means sitting with them, uh, understanding um, what is the meaning of all the actions that are expected to occur during the simulations from the teacher perspective, from the student's perspective, where are the the areas in the in the classroom that are important that have different meanings um, in order to convert uh, sensor data into something that that they can actually understand um, and this means um, applying lots of techniques brought from the design uh, practice and, and disciplines um, some of them are called generative tools or tools for dreaming um, in which they were also thinking uh, um, and telling us about what they want to see if we can capture data uh, from these physical environments and how they want to see things. Um, and we also put together new tools. Um, for example, this was a learner data journey tool to understand how the information is flowing in the physical space and the opportunities for, for capturing data and also for visualizing um the still traces of of this data um but we also started looking at, at the activity an actual activity this is one early example before before bringing qe into the into this project this was just as we usually do you know as as researchers in 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 educational data mining for example we collect lots of data uh, and we see what happens so this was one uh, early example in which we use um, a computer vision system to detect the bodies of the students around, around the mannequin, the patient mannequin during the activity. And we started to, to get patterns. Uh, for example, in the group at the, at the top is, um, is one, one group of students, four students, and T1, T2, and T3, just the activity divided in three slices just to see um, the temporality of the data. And we, we saw a behavior in which the students remain at the base of the, the bed. There is meaning there. And the teachers, when you look at that, they explain, ah, oh, this is where there's a handover. They're looking at documents. And, and we realized that there's lots of meaning in, in these positions because in group B, for example, the students were immediately very close to the, to the patients, right? And we started to see these two emerging patterns from other, other students. Um, and we realized, okay, we need the meaning to add the meaning to the data. Um, so we had to revisit our, our process um, and, and tie it to, to the outputs from the co-design um, sessions. And we start, for this is one example, uh, how we extracted some qualitative codes from these interviews from observations and from the learning design uh, for, for the specific simulations. So for a specific simulation, in this case is a resuscitation um, case in which the patient needs um, to be rescued um, using CPR. Uh, these were the areas that the teachers and the, and the students, especially the teachers from the learning design were indicating were, were very important. So, for example, being behind the, the bed area is critical because someone needs to be there holding the, the space um, when there is a CPR uh, being executed. Um, and students need to be next to the patient or being on top of the patient during the procedure. Being close to the trolley, is, there's also meaning there. So we selected this, we converted this physical space into codes of the physical space. Um, so we could then convert X and Y uh, coordinates into, into meaningful areas. Um, and we also use another theoretical framework because um, we are working with, with very complex uh, information. There are things that are happening at the, at the dialogue level um, in the physical space. So according to this uh, framework, the ACAT framework or activity center analysis and design framework, proposed by uh, Lucila Carvalho and Peter Gudja originally, uh, they, they specify that there are three things that a teacher can design for. The physical space and the, and the tools that are being used, obviously the, the tasks, uh, the, the epistemic aspect, what are the tasks, the, the goals that need to be met, um, and how to, to scaffold those tasks 
and, and the social situation as well. Like in this case, um, each student has a role, it's his teamwork, and not everyone is supposed to be doing the same. There is a leader. Um, but we also have affective responses, and this is not necessarily inside the framework, but we start to realize there are different um, aspects or dimensions of the collaborative activities that makes it very complex. And from affective, we can, from the affective realm, we can get physiological responses that are very important for, for these scenarios because nurses are under pressure and then they need to reflect on the levels of stress and how they react and how um, they uh, react even if they are stressed or not, and if, it, if the stress helps them or, or is actually um, stopping them to, to do the work effectively. Um, and so we put together everything uh, and we uh, started to map from low level data to these higher order constructs or, or dimensions in this case um, of collaboration. So if we start from the, from the middle, these constructs include uh, the strategies in the physical space, uh, you know, how the, the nurses are moving, um, the actions and procedures, or dialogue in this case, with, we didn't consider the dialogue because uh, we didn't have that data automatically captured, um, but the actions that are related to the, to the procedures um, are part of the, the epistemic dimension of collaboration the communication with the patient, teamwork communication, obviously related to social aspects and changes in emotional arousal was one of the indicators for us that belongs to the affective realm. And we then uh, started to map, okay, what data we can capture now? Um, obviously we, can, we would like to capture everything, but what's the data we can capture? Um, and that is important also for, for the teachers uh, to consider during the assessment or during the reflection. And from multimodal uh, sensors, we started to map to this construct. So uh, let's, let's go with an example that's going to be clearer. Um, but this is the conceptualization of all this procedure. We start from multimodal data, let's say D. Uh, we need uh, domain knowledge, uh, the expert knowledge from what's happening in, the, in, in these uh, classroom situations. Uh, that is, you, coming from the learning design, but also from observing the, the teachers and what the teachers were saying that is, is important. And we propose this multimodal modeling or the multimodal matrix. Um, so let's dive into this multimodal matrix. So this was an early version um, in which we have these um, dimensions of collaboration at the top. Um, but I'm going to comment on that. <laughs> And then we have uh, the rows, which uh, in our case, uh, the data is coming from different sensors. So we decided to synchronize all the, the sensors and um, the sampling of each sensor is, is different. So we have information that comes every second. Sometimes it comes um, just as an action that happens in the, in the time, just, okay, someone is, um, uh, attach um, a, sense, uh, a sensory measure to the patient. It's just something that happens in action. A CPR is different because it happens in a span of time. So um, we decided to, to give it a go and say, okay, let's create a matrix in which each row is going to be one second. And, and then let's see if we can model and extract information from this. Um, and we also have the notion of stances, which in our cases were little phases of things that were expected to occur. So all the actions in that phase were contextually meaningful. Um, and then all the, the columns then started to be information about each uh, participant. So we have R RN is a registered nurse, one, two, three, four, or team leader, and they have different roles. And we get information about positioning for the physical aspects, um, actions that each per person perform and the social aspects um, we had if we're, they were speaking, not what they were saying, but if there was uh, speech being present, we were capturing this via microphones. And um, in the affective uh, aspect, uh, if there were peaks in electrodermal activity. Um, and then we, we fill all everything with ones or zeros or different levels of, of activity. 
with an accelerometer, for example, we have even um, information about the wrist uh, uh, level of motion. So, for example, if we look at uh, how we divided the, the physical space uh, in meaningful uh, codes, uh, we use those codes to, to convert the X and Y data. So we end up with ones and zeros instead of X and Y coordinates. Um, in the case of uh, accelerometer data, which is the wristband acceleration, we also have um, these, these levels of activity based on, uh, on previous cases in which pretty much CPR was the, the most intense activity. So that was a highly intense activity of motion captured by the uh, wristband. Um, and peaks of uh, electrodermal activity were ones or zeros because a peak is just something that happens in the time. Um, so we tried to, to then convert every, everything to ones and zeros. And obviously actions in this case, they were logged by, by an observer. So we have a combination also of human coding being inserted into this multimodal matrix. So what we get is actually multimodal data coming from sensors or, or in this case, it's an actual interface to monitor what's happening. And this can be used as also by, by students because they do this kind of monitoring already in these scenarios. Uh, but it was done by, by a researcher. Um, and microphones. Uh, microphones is very challenging, <laughs> using microphones in these scenarios. Um, we, we got information and we, we could do it for small periods of time and convert, detect a human voice. But there is lots of issues. I'm not going to get into this, but I'm just saying that, um, yeah, this is a, a whole problem in itself, how to capture the dialogue, not even if someone is speaking. Um, so coming back to this model, uh, what we did, and this was presented in Kite 19, was to interrogate this multimodal matrix, not, not using um, uh, ENA, because there were no enough uh, cases that we recorded. But we said uh, we, we, our objective is to interrogate this multimodal matrix and show something to the students and teachers. So we designed some proxies. So this is one example of, okay, we, we just focus on verbal communication. If we reconstruct that matrix of the microphones, we just can get this, this uh, social network of who's speaking with whom. Um, we create a more complex visualization to the, uh, identify these this dots in, in, a, in a timeline, which are the peaks in, in arousal. And just to, for quickly, uh, for the teacher, for example, to notice that RN4 didn't have any peak, not much activity, not much movement. Um, so the, the idea is was for this to invite a dialogue around this representation of what was happening, if RN4 was disengaged or it was in very, very uh, uh, quiet and, and, and not engaging in the activity. And um, also we, we could get the, the areas in which the teams were present. It was next to the patient, on top of the patient, compare across teams, and a more and more complex that we're gonna go, go for it, uh, which is a timeline of all the actions that the students were doing. Um, so this is one of the examples of the, of the movement, um, how the one, one team, uh, they were doing CPR and how the proxy just pretty much explains where, where the team was around the, the mannequin with, this, with these codes. This is very, very simple, but um, it was interesting just to do it because in multimodal learn analytics, there are not many interfaces. So we started to, okay, we, we need to, to have some interfaces and, and start to show information to, to students and teachers. And this is the most complex um, interface, which is uh, um, for each uh, team member. In this case, it's a very, very tiny team of two people. Uh, each action is presented in the on the time, and this was became our base visualization to show information in a meaningful way. Um, we call this as an exploratory visualization. This is some work um, that was done by Vanessa Cheveria, comparing it with um, inform, you know for with other visualizations that invite people to um, understand the data. And this is for exploring exploring the data, exploring all the data data points. But what what does it say? What are these data points? So, um, and, and then our next uh, step was to, to help the, the, whoever is looking at this complex visualization to understand the meaning, okay, did the, the students did it right or not? 
So there is a level of assessment. So we brought the assessment criteria from the teacher uh, that the teacher would use to describe, okay, these, these uh, actions were performed in the right time or not, um, to create a learning model, to assess whatever it was in the multimodal matrix. Uh, and this learning model, in our, in our case so far, we've been using rule-based algorithms, um, which is how this, the teachers naturally um, explain um, how the, the logs are assessed. So for example, uh, if the compression depth should, be, you know, is um, below five centimeters, then it's too low. If it's above six centimeters, it's too high. Uh, a nurse uh, should be located at the top of the bed during CPR. So there is complexity there. So we look at the data and uh, is a nurse in this, in this uh, quadrangle, uh, the X and Y positions are there during other actions happen, or, or, or other actions were happening. And so it's lots of rules that, that we can create to interrogate this multimodal matrix. And the idea was to create data stories instead of uh, just proxies or plotting the data. Um, so these data stories um, uh, are going to be explained by um, Gloria. So I'm going to now stop um, sharing and hand it to Gloria. Yes. Okay, so um, we call the team timeline that uh, Roberto was talking about uh, the vanilla timeline, because as he mentioned, it doesn't offer any guidance to students to interpret the meaning of the position of the actions, their timeliness or their correctness. So pretty much what I'm going to be presenting now is um, two different prototypes that we have the chance to test with teachers and students based on this uh, modeling technique that Robert just described. So the first one was proved with teachers. And uh, what we did was to enhance the basic uh, timeline with uh, storytelling layers. So for example, uh, this, uh, this one tells a story about the time responsiveness of two students, RN1 and RN2 executing clinical actions according to the basic life support uh, protocol. So we propose to automatically render visual elements on top of the vanilla timeline visualization according to the teacher's learning intentions. So that way we translate each pedagogical intention into a set of rules to add visual enhancements, such as emphasizing relevant data points. We can also add exemplary titles to communicate the main message of the story. We use uh, shaded areas to group data points, uh, as in this case, to represent team as low responsiveness. And annotations that explain the meaning of particular data points by highlighting important events, for example, a delay in delivering a resuscitation shock. Other layers can be added uh, to highlight mistakes made by the team or to communicate additional insights such as arousal levels, such the one we are having a look in this slide. So the teacher has the option to um, select any layer he wants to, to show and he actually can see different layers at a time. Additionally, we also show the rules that we use to add these different elements in a particular layer. So we explain we're kind of opening the code that we are using for the students and the teachers to know and understand why we are showing them these kind of messages. The second prototype was tested with the students. So the previous one was tested with only teachers, but we have the chance to interview students while they were using the tool. So pretty much at this second prototype, we uh, evaluate that the students were performing a specific actions uh, or these critical actions that we elicit from the teachers or the educators. So pretty much they have to assess vital signs every 10 minutes administer and stop antibiotics. So this was an allergic reaction to antibiotic protocols or simulation. 
they have to perform an ECG and call the doctor. So these were the actions that the students uh, are supposed to perform during the simulation. And we elicit this from the learning design and we confirm this with the educators. So this is how the prototype looks like. So again, what we have here is just the vanilla timeline. So you can see all the actions and we um, we plot the, the layers or the stories in this one based on the critical actions. So each of these buttons on the bottom uh, represent each of these actions <clears throat> and the students have the chance to click on each of it. For example, this team fell in assessing vital signs uh, regularly after the patient complains. So this is one of the stories we show them. The same principles of data storytelling were used to present these prototypes. Uh, so this story, for example, explained that the team performed as it was expected by the educator and the blue color indicates so. This other example presents a shaded area in yellow color to indicate that something was missed. In this second study, we evaluate a second prototype to present the physiological data, which summarizes the arousal level uh, of each nurse, and we plot it as a label. So they have the chance to validate if they were mild aroused or high aroused in each of these specific uh, phases. So pretty much this table summarizes different example uh, collaboration practice that Roberto was talking about. So although many activities which are part of the workflow are automated, there are still some manually actions. For example, all the sensors da data was manually synchronized, as I reckon Roberto mentioned previously. Uh, but we also consider that in this modeling of QE techniques, we can have actually manually added data into the matrix modeling uh, technique, which is also okay. So pretty much you can see here um, how far are we from fully automated the process. Um, so that was all the presentation of the prototypes. I reckon Simon now it's concluding. I will stop sharing. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Gloria. Okay. So just to wrap up here. Um, all right. So just to, to recap, this is the challenge um, that, that we that we think we're dealing with here with quantitative ethnography uh, as a field, right? And we've discussed what we think uh, it means to handle this intersection with integrity um, in a particular context. So this is this was the question we asked, and we we, we found that the principles underpinning the multi uh, underpinning QE, um, you know, we you saw how we we derived the matrix, which is based on that. Uh, QE-like representation of, of, of rows, columns, uh, standards, etc., and it, it worked. It worked for quality uh, for for real-time streaming multimodal data, which was which is very encouraging. Um, is the work that we've talked about giving you ideas about what you might do with QE? Well, we hope so, but we look forward to hearing your thoughts on that. Uh, maybe the multimodal matrix is something you might be able to use. Maybe the kinds of representations we've been generating off that might be useful. Um, and um, we've been doing this for co-located embodied activity, um, you know, where the room is becoming aware of what's going on in it. Uh, there is no user interface in the traditional clicking and typing sense. The, the room and the space and actions are are the, the sources of data. So just to sort of wrap up, I think that what we're talking about here is that we are building on and augmenting QE ideas. Um, first of all, we've got to understand the human activity system. And we've done that in a particular set of ways, um, including envisioned practices. We're talking about future work systems as well. Um, because uh, we want to invent um, a way of doing debriefing which is going to, it's going to change the way they do debriefing as well. Um, we are integrating qual and quant. Um, um, and moreover, we are developing techniques that can read from and write to 
this common data representation. And, and this, this can have machine contributions as well as human contributions um, in the way that we map from this low level data to higher order constructs that are meaningful to people. Um, we would like to get to a fully automated analysis um, in terms of generating the feedback replay interfaces for the debriefing. We're not there yet in terms of, that's just an engineering challenge in, in some ways. Um, but we have a, far, a partially automated analytics workflow so far. Okay, so we're really happy to hear your thoughts about that. Um, thanks very much indeed, and we're open for questions. Quick round of applause, <clears throat> excuse me, for the presenters. That was great. Um, so we can open things up now to questions if people want to um, you know, add things to the chat or just un, uh, unmute yourself to, to go ahead and ask. Um, please, please go ahead. Yeah, if I can. can go me? ahead, Rogers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Simon and the team. I think the tool is very interesting. Um, I was just asking around the, I think you talked about like uh, how you create rules, like how, how the how the how the tool can actually help in uh, the teacher, for example, to relate to the pedagogical intentions, for example. So I was just wondering because I think that's that's a that's a very important uh, kind of feature for the for the tool, especially for teachers' uh, practice, like practical use. Because I've been working with teachers, and the question is, okay, if I want to use this, like to uh, to understand, like to, to relate, uh, to relate the data that can be captured to the actual classroom work. So the question is, uh, how possible is it for the teachers to actually do this? Of course, you have talked about that you are moving towards uh, doing the automation process. But another, I'm wondering whether that will be possible. For example, if teachers are using it from different perspectives, of course, someone would, should be able to say, okay, for this activity, I want to uh, visualize or to see. Uh, I want, for example, if it's a discussion forum, uh, I'm just giving an example. If I talked, if I told students to post five times, uh, can this be generated or can this be uh, visualized by the tool? So that was, that's something I'm wondering about whether it's something you are thinking about in the, in the future. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, well, if I, I'll just make an initial comment on that. Um, so you know, if I just put this diagram back up, this is where we move from the language of educators to the uh, to, to map it down into lower level data, and that is um, what where the conversation happens with the with the educators. You know, do you think that these things that we are capturing are good proxies for these things you care about at this end, which is curriculum outcomes, assessment criteria, and so forth? Yeah. So just as we've shown you rules from multimodal embodied activity, you know, if you wanted to capture the fact that the student had not posted five times to a forum, just to take your example, well, yeah, we could say we have this notion of engagement, which is a high level construct, and we're going to interpret that in terms of certain behaviors. It might be the number of times they've posted, it might be a whole bunch of other proxies for engagement. And then you want to make that visible in the user interface to the teacher or even to the student. I suppose there could be a, a challenge potentially in terms of if, I mean, I think Rogers was talking about this a little bit, if, if different instructors have a range of things that they would count as, as you know, important or indicative of the things that they're looking for, I, I like that piece of your guys' work is that you're bringing in both the instructors and the students in terms of their interpretation. But then there's also a challenge in terms of if there's a, how wide of a range of things people are looking at um, or would count as what would count as evidence potentially could make it challenging. But um, I thought that, that was, um, that's one of the strongest pieces I think of this work is in terms of having it kind of define QE regardless of what you're doing is that the fact that you're bringing it to the people that are actually in the community that you're looking at and kind of co-constructing what the codes are and checking with them and having that aspect of validation. Um, and then also, anyways, I, I won't go on. I know there's other people that have questions. Jamie, were you going to 
Uh, it looks like there's also something in the chat. Jamie, did you have your hand up? Um, yeah, so um, thanks for a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. I, um, I also kind of work, I work in the clinical space as well. So this was very relevant to my uh, sort of mindset. Um, it seems like what you've done here really closely situates within complex adaptive system theory uh, and the work that was or is done by Dave Snowden um, out of the UK. Uh, and, and I think you've kind of modeled that quite well in terms of um, uh, social sim systems thinking approach. Uh, but I'm just wondering about tacit knowledge. So you talked about um, you know, having that knowledge that's necessary to drive the, or modulate the actions within the simulations. Did you look at any sort of subgroup analysis for tacit knowledge specifically? Hmm, interesting. Can you give us an example of what you mean by tacit knowledge there? So tacit uh, knowledge isn't necessarily learned formal knowledge that's provided within uh, a formal education system, but more so through lived experience. Um, so, and um, I think <laughs> Sylvie, could, Sylvia could probably talk a, a, like for days about tacit knowledge, but um, in the nursing space, it's really important because a lot of how healthcare professionals react in a complex system isn't necessarily dependent on formal learning theory but more so on the lived experiences and that tacit knowledge within um, their time spent as a nurse or nurse educator or whichever. So I was just wondering if you looked at or seen differences amongst different levels of, of um, nurses or um, students versus educators, et cetera. I can respond to that. Uh, no, I mean, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> it's super interesting. But um, what you're saying is something that we observe all the time in the simulations. I mean, there are so many things that are happening that are important for a student's experience. Um, and sometimes the teacher doesn't even realize that things are happening. Uh, we focus more into the formal learning outcomes just to start with something. It's so complex to to focus on too many things. And at least the learning design and the expected learning outcomes are something that uh, happens from one session to the other, from one classroom to the other, and is expected by the teacher and uh, is covered usually during the debrief. Um, but, but yeah, I know that's so interesting. There are so many things that happen and um, we have even seen cases in which the manipulation of um, of some objects can can lead to to injury, and that has happened in the classroom as well. And and the teacher never never knows, never knew that that happened, and that was not taught explicitly. Um, but I'm sure the the student learned a lot and tried to communicate that to the teacher, and, and there was no chance to that. Things things that that were happening a lot, uh, learning opportunities um, that were just maybe missed, or there was no chance to to go and focus in the debrief on them because there's so many people. And, and eventually it would be, would be great to be able to capture those instances um, because to not to lose all those opportunities. Yes, it's a, yeah, that's yeah, a great I, idea. I may probably add something. Uh, when we normally talk to the teachers and we try to extract those expected behaviors, the, you know, what they expect from the students to do, they always say, it depends on how experts they are. So we always said, okay, how we model expertise. So that's something we have to consider. And yeah, I agree. There's many things which are happening because uh, most of them already work in hospitals. So they are more experts than others. And as Roberto mentioned, some of them are just practicing in this scenario, which is you know a safe scenario where they can practice. And even being a safe space, they can injure their set their cells because we have seen things like that. So yeah, there's many things that still needs to be modeled. But yeah, it's very complex too. And maybe the other thing I would add is <clears throat> clearly we can write rules about things that are um, unambiguously right or wrong. You know, you fail to do this quickly enough, you know, the patient's going to die, right? So there are things that are right and wrong. There are things you can do in the wrong order. That's all good explicit knowledge. Those are protocols that, that students have to learn. Now, uh, 
what I think we're trying to do with these interfaces is make it possible to explore and replay where tacit knowledge could come out. So when we're capturing stuff that used to be um, only recorded on, on a video camera, but it was too much work to actually go back, find the video and then scroll to the right place in the video. Um, you know, there's six teams. So we're trying to make it easy to get back into the moment where the, the educator could talk about something. Um, the fact that, you know, we have got some rules about things, but we don't have rules about everything. So the fact that you can look at location and who was involved and, and, and why, are there, why are there such stark differences between two teams in the patterns, those are provocations to conversation and reflection. And that's where tacit expertise is going to come out on, on, from, from the clinicians. Um, so that's another way of thinking about tacit knowledge and tacit knowing and embodied expertise, uh, you know, which we can't codify in advance, but we're making, we're providing resources for conversations. Yeah. Great. Uh, great a question and great answers. Um, Zach, I think you had your hand up first and then Sylvie, uh, why don't you ask after Zach? Great. Uh, thanks, guys, for the presentation. Um, I had a question re regarding some of the insights from the multiple uh, streams of data. Uh, so from what I could tell, um, it, within the multimodal matrix, you had uh, representation of the different data streams and you use that to create these uh, proxy visualizations or representations of different streams of data. And these were used to draw insights. Um, and I'm wondering the extent to which uh, uh, you guys looked at the um, relationships between those particular data streams to, to ge generate insights. Um, I'm assuming this might have happened uh, in that uh, storytelling uh, visualization and I, maybe I just missed it, but um, it seemed like there was a uh, uh, analysis of this data stream separately, but I'm wondering how they were integrated together to pr provide some insight for the teachers or the students. Laura, do you want to talk a bit about, about how the, the, learn, the educator's intent is being carried through into the user interface? Oh, well, first of all, um, yeah, um, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Zachary? Zach, yeah, Zach, Zach sorry. Yeah, um, yeah we, we actually, you know, mostly what we have been doing with these prototypes is combining just kind of two things, you know, the epistemic a dimension that Roberto was mentioned, which are the actions that are happening. And we pretty much are combining them. Um, you know, it, we try, we're trying to make sense to this data. So the first thing we have are the actions that are happening. And then we can say, okay, during this period of time, uh, the positioning and proximity and localization and uh, the physiological activity was, was like this. So pretty much, uh, we haven't explored much uh, the meaning of combining the different modalities, which is something which is really interesting and I, I reckon it, it must be something of research. Uh, so we haven't combined all of them to understand further insights uh, and I reckon probably it would be very interesting to do that. Um, with the prototypes actually the teachers have the chance to combine the layers so they can choose different different layers at a time um, but th that's something we need to explore in terms of how insightful it is for the teachers to combine them and what kind of insights they get by combining them or just by using one of them so pretty much we've been exploring what they say when they use each of them at a time and we know what kind of insights they can get from that but not by the combination of all of that modalities. Yeah. So the, the layering interface allows you to hide and show layers, you know, like in Photoshop. So you can, you can combine those different data sources visually. Mm -hmm. And then the, the storytelling layers model that we showed is showing how pedagogical knowledge is coming in to a generic, a generic, uh, model of data visualization, right? The gray boxes are the generic forms of data visualization. And then we're bringing in pedagogical knowledge here and here and data storytelling principles here to create that. And that's, that's why we would claim that we've got a, an angle on what makes an educational visualization different from just any old visualization. Mm -hmm. 
right? Teaching and learning are different from other kinds of domains. Well, how do you bring that knowledge in? Makes sense. Thank you. Bilvi, did you want to ask your question? I did. Um, it, it, first of all, wonderful presentation and absolutely great project. I, I think it's fascinating. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I understand that when you say that you integrated qual, qual and quant data, by qual data, um, you, are you representing that qual data for now as uh, you're indicating who's speaking, who they're speaking to, and for how long they're speaking. So you're, you, you haven't yet looked at the, the contents of, of their, their narrative, is that true? That's correct. Um, but there's absolutely nothing to stop us from doing that and then inserting additional rows and columns and, and values from a rich human analysis. So, right. yeah, I mean, the way, we, the, I would say that there's qual data in there because we spent an awful lot of time trying to understand what that activity means. Yeah. Um, and that shaped, that shaped the way that we chunk the data and, and the categories of data we're attending to and how you define zones. You know, what, what mean, you know, you can only stand, understand what a position means in a place by understanding that activity deeply. Um, and then, yeah, if you wanted to do a very detailed qualitative analysis, of the text and the, the discourse, et cetera, then yeah, that could be done manually or it could even be automated potentially using the wonderful tools we have from things like Encoder, et cetera. So that's just waiting to be done in that sense. Is, can I ask a piggyback question on that? Um, is, I mean, and Roberto mentioned some of the challenges with the audio, um, but I'm wondering, is that part of what precluded say using a tool like ENA or um, were there other, I think you guys mentioned having a certain amount, a certain amount of data. Could you guys talk a little bit about um, why you might not have or might, what you, I, I, I'm imagining ways in which different analyses could com be combined with the tools that you guys are already putting together. And I think one of the big values I see in this work is kind of articulating what it means, like in terms of the data representation itself, how it can be read and read for multiple things. It can be both machine coded and hand coded. Um, I think those are really important tenants. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe why you didn't use ENA or why you could and, and, and how we might be able to combine um, some other um, discourse analyses with the work that you guys are doing. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, there are so many things, so many topics here. <laughs> um, and that also related with what Zach asked um, about also exploring how to combine the different um, so modalities pretty much. Um, there are multiple responses. One, um, we were... We're, our goal is to show an interface to, to teachers and students to be used during the debrief. That means um, that if that's our goal, uh, if we just send the videos to transcription, obviously that's, that's kind of tangential. If we, if we had resources, probably we would just do that and, and bring also the content of the conversation. So that, that's one thing. And that also then means that if the microphones or the technology to do speech to text conversion is not that accurate, then uh, that's another, a different project. We want to do it. That's part of our, our uh, work for the next three years, uh, using better technology, lapel microphones, and try to, to, to use the best technology to convert from speech to text. Um, it, why not? We, we're not presenting ENA. We have used ENA. It's just that uh, it's work in, in progress and it's submitted um, to some the revision. Um, so we didn't want to, to show that just to, yeah, being, uh, yeah, that's a good practice. <laughs> but we have been using it um, not for um, speech uh, content uh, data, but from some of our multimodal data. Um, and I think uh, the, the one related with SAC as well is how to, um, if we have been trying to find correlations between multimodal data, or not necessarily correlations, but relationships, that's also very interesting. Um, but as Gloria said, we have been focusing on kind of driving everything from the actions. And that's probably because that's the language of the, the teachers. So obviously they are not going to 
create a rule saying uh, the high levels of arousal are related to the position of, of nurses because there's no research on that. So probably we also need to, do con to conduct uh, foundational research um, and related to the number of, of um, uh, instances that we have recorded as well, they are not extremely high because they require lots of complexity just for doing the data capture. So we have a few data sets and the largest one is of 11 sessions. So uh, it's really hard to find correlations or, or, or causations in, from this data set, you know, it's very complex. So yeah, that's kind of the little answers to, to all the, the little questions. No, that's that's great, and I, I, I think, um, I think, hopefully, these are conversations we could we can also continue um, at, at the conference too. I think David had a question. If we could sneak one in, I know we're coming up on time, but we did start a little bit late. So, um, David, why don't you uh, uh, sneak one in, and uh, then we can do some closing after that. Yeah, asking a professor to sneak a question in when there's not a lot of time is almost always a bad choice. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, I did. Uh, so I wanted to, first of all, I, there was a couple of things I, I, I really liked about the presentation. For one thing, I just liked the work. Um, but uh, the presentation was also just, it was very clear. And there was a lot of complicated stuff going on, a lot of complicated machinery. And it was really, really easy to follow. I mean, I do have the advantage of having seen some of this work before. But um, I, it, was a, it was a very nice job of kind of showing the deconstruction of a pretty complicated algorithm. Um, the other thing I particular, another thing I particularly like about both the presentation and the work is actually that flow chart that you guys have that goes, you know, K to M to LM to I'm, I'm, I'm butchering it here, but Simon just showed that slide, um, which does a really nice job of kind of mapping the conceptual logic going from the original data through the data representation through the data analytics and then out the other end to something that uh, is consumable. You know, there's a lot, we, we, we talk about the, the second part of that, like going from some kind of analysis to something that the, um, uh, that's actually consumable by teachers and students or other users, but this actually lays out the logic of that nicely. Um, one thing I wanted to, I, I'm, this is, this is a sort of a question, but time permitting, I'm also okay if people just want to, just want to smile and nod and, and pass on it, but, um, you know, one of the things that I think of as the hallmark of ethnography, and therefore also quantitative ethnography, is actually the, its focus on meaning. Um, uh, the, one of my favorite lines from Antoine de saint Exupéry is that we don't live by things, we live by the meanings of things. Um, I think about that as sort of a very ethnographic uh, point of view. And you guys use the word meaning and meaningful a lot of, uh, and a lot of, shows up on a lot of slides and it was said over and over again. Um, and, uh, and I'm I'm wondering what you meant, what, like what, how you were using it in in this context, and how you were thinking about it, because that seems at the core of the matter. And I think one of the common confusions is that we can only talk about meaning in the context of stuff that people say. And I don't think that's true. I don't think it's true. And I don't think it's what's going on here. So I'm just hoping maybe you can expand our horizons a little bit as to how we think about the E part of QE in terms of like. Like what what you meant by meaning and meaningful in this through this kind of life cycle of the data? Sure. Um, shall I kick off? Um, all right. So the example we we put up a slide that said here are the five critical zones. All right. That's what made that that room meaningful. In that activity, that you know. We don't, we don't care about your X, Y position at the definition of centimeters. We care about broadly where you are in terms of these five zones. So that's an example of meaning in the activity before we even come in and, and do any, any stuff with technology. So that's one way of th thinking about it. And that would be, that's what I would think of as ethnographic work. I mean, we're not trained ethnographers, but we are trying to understand the qualitative phenomenon in question. All right. Another sense of meaning is the sense making that goes on around these visual representations we create. Uh, we've already talked about the fact that there are some explicit rules about right and wrong, right? But then there's the, the conversation and the meaning making that goes on when we put up a social diagram and we can see that a particular nurse who was supposed to be the team leader was not stepping back and letting the team do stuff he or she was diving in and doing too much. 
all right? And that's a, that's a resource for conversation and, and a way of saying to the team leader, you needed to step back there because your job is different, you know? So these visualizations, which again, we have to test with the educators and test with the students are meant to be meaningful because they are abstractions that filter out a whole bunch of noise and focus you on just one thing at a time, which is important for this, for mastering this kind of activity. So I'll shut up there. I don't know whether Roberta or Gloria want to jump in with other angles on meaning. No, oh, yeah, uh, coming from um, HCI point of view, human computer interaction, um, and also working with data, uh, I, I think that's the, the takeaway message uh, when we talk about meaning is, okay, if we want to show some data, some imagine physiological data when we just see time series. And actually we did that <laughs> once and show it to the teacher. Um, what is important in the end is the meaning. So if we want to create a, a user interface, we are not going to plot data. We want to, to tell a story uh, because the story is, is how humans um, make meaning of, of the world. Um, and, and that's the, the, our traditional way of communication, not data, it's, it's stories. So that's kind of the link and why we emphasize uh, meaning uh, as a key construct. Yeah, and, and I'll just add that, you know, the stuff that Gloria was showing, <clears throat> are the reason that we are doing so much post-processing on the raw data is because we want the students to take the messages from it that we want them to take from it, right? You put a chart in front of a student, they could read all sorts of stuff into it that's not, it's either wrong or it's just not helpful. And so the, the idea of including the educator's intent in the storytelling layers is, is, is basically putting a filter in front of the student, but we're not apologizing for that because otherwise they could just drown in the data. We want them to be able to extract the story from it that's going to be most helpful for them as a learner. So that's another perspective on it. Thank you. Uh, I hate to put kind of an end or stop to the, or Gloria, were you going to say something? I saw your mic move. Are you sure? No, thanks. Oh, okay. I didn't want to cut you off if you had something to add. Um, so uh, I know we have another question from Meishi. Um, maybe that's something that uh, afterwards people could follow up on. I think it's a really great question. Um, but I think David had an announcement that he wanted to make about uh, the QE Society. And I'll just quickly um, say, hopefully we can continue this conversation um, at ICQE coming up um, in, in a you know, in, in January. Um, also look for an email about feedbacks. We'll try to get your, your guys' email addresses for those who have registered for all these events so we can hopefully improve or keep things that we think are working for next year's webinar series. And I'd just like to thank our presenters again for their great work and also uh, for their, their presentation and engagement with us today. I, I think it was, it was really um, solid and I, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, so thank you guys. Um, and then David, I'll, I'll hand it over to you as we kind of finalize and wrap up to, to make a, an announcement. Yeah, so I can just, I can keep this pretty brief. Um, one of the big take homes from the last conference was that people wanted to have a learned society that uh, for, for QE that they could, people could belong to and that it could do work on behalf of the community. Um, <clears throat> we, we have, we set one up. Um, we have a board of, of directors and, and everything. And, um, as you can see, this is one of the uh, activities that the society has been sponsored, has sponsored. But um, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, membership in the society is gonna be included with your registration fees for ICQE, and that will cover your registration for this academic year. And then going forward, kind of at each conference, there's a, a, chance, to, a chance to renew that. Um, but uh, uh, as of, which means as of, essentially the beginning of February, you can officially put on your CV that you are a member in good standing of the International Society for Quantitative Ethnography if you want. And I'm sure there'll be more messages coming from the society and from the board. Um, but I just wanna thank Brandon and Simon who've done such a great job in taking a uh, lead on behalf of the society um, for this, this particular activity. And of course, the program committee chairs and other folks for the upcoming, for the current and upcoming conferences one program committee chair is is actually here with us. I don't know, Sylvie, if you want <laughs> if you want to say anything, but uh, Sylvie is going to be one of the uh, the uh, program committee chairs for the conference that will be next fall, 
in Pepperdine, assuming that vaccines work. So. I, I just wanted to say it's a huge honor and thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to it. Great. Well, we should probably call it there then, Brennan. Yep. Thank you, everyone. And I, I see that, uh, Roberto, thank you for answering Macy's question too. And, and thanks again for everybody for coming. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the future. It's been great. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. That was great, Simon. I'm well not, done. not at all surprised, but that's <laughs> great stuff. It's, it's nice to, yeah, we, it's a bit of an update on a few things since we presented yeah. in 2019. Yeah. You know, Gloria's yeah. PhD is really pushing forward more on the storytelling interfaces and she's, she's going to be implementing some tools to help educators design their own rules and stuff like that. Yeah, that's awesome. yeah, I hadn't really thought about it, about it this way until you guys were answering that question, which is, uh, so I'm glad that I asked it. I mean, in some ways, in within QE itself, the formal mechanism for that construction of meaning is the step to the big C codes, right? So essentially the column, what it would be the columns in the matrix that you analyze are assertions about the meanings of what happened. The actual data layer sits, by, there's a data layer that sits behind that then there's kind of this reconstruction of the original data in terms of meaning. And you guys are actually adding another, yet another piece on that, which is another layer of meaning construction, which is the meaning construction that the consumers are making after the visualization is presented. That is, there's another re-encoding of the data in a sense, there's a encoding of the analysis. So I, I think that was a, that's sort of a really interesting way of looking at it. Whether that's the way you want to look at it, I don't know. But that's like, I was like, oh, right. There's a whole other right. set of codes, which is mm -hmm. the encoding of the significance of the way in which these meaningful categories have been, have been assembled over time. Right. And, and, and your choice, your choice of how you're going to, you know, make sense of the low level data is shaped by who you're going to present it to. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, as researchers, we would choose perhaps a different set of codes than the ones that we need to present back to the non-technical students and educators. Right? Yeah, although it, it does raise an interesting question as to what, so now you have two sets of codes that are interfacing, right? And so on the one hand, like as ethnographers, right, we of course want our construal of the, culture that we're observing of the activity that we're observing to be grounded in the emic understandings that people have but typically we don't just take the emic codes right there's some there's sort of a negotiation between our understanding in a systematic way and the edict in the edict terms and then their own understanding so there's there's sort of a way in which now like usually ethnographies are not written with the goal of handing it to the people in the society so they can do something better and now you're, we sort of introduced this other whole side of, the, of your diagram there, which is the loop back to people. But that now also introduces, as I say, sort of this other set of encodings. And so it's not 